can go ahead and start here. And of course, uh, this when it goes up on YouTube, we're going to say, please go up to the top right on your iPhone or smartphone. It may be in a different location, but there's a little bell symbol and you're supposed to click that so that you get notices. And please comment below on our presentation. Let us know, participate with us at the Church of Free Thought. So this presentation is uh, going on live February 21st. And if you're coming in on February 21st or later in the day, you can just see what we do at church. What do atheists do at church? Our program today, I'm gonna just have some remarks on what to say, when, and we've had this feature before at our in-person services, and generally it's about um, goddess and other people making some comment, and maybe you're in an elevator and you have limited time, and how do you respond quickly? The idea here is to have thought through some things. You know, one thing we have um, a disadvantage compared to the believers is that they've got all their rote thing to say, all their little patter and uh, it's all been worked out over centuries. They can just say it without even thinking, but we have to think. We've got to figure out uh, how we're going to come at things, which is a good thing. We're glad of that, but sometimes it's good to have thought it beforehand so that you can be ready. So here's the kind of things that people say to us that may stop us. Maybe some of these things don't bother us too much, but other things are, as you can see, pretty offensive when they're saying, oh, atheists don't have any morals and uh, we're you're mad at God and then they have these throwaway lines of course like Jesus loves you and I'll pray for you um, so we'll just talk a little bit briefly about um, at least one or two of these well one of these things primarily and that is the God usedness of course this has some special significance in the time of pandemic because uh, maybe now you wouldn't say, God bless you, you'd say, stop trying to give me coronavirus. But this is a common thing. And it's interesting, of course, we may wonder, why in the world do people feel compelled to say something after someone sneezes? We don't say someone say anything to someone when they burp or pass gas to some other part of their body or any number of things, but for some reason, sneezes also always elicit these comments. So here's one idea that in 590 CE in the era that in Rome there was plague and the Pope said that everybody should say to others who sneeze, God bless you, because that uh, sneeze was a sign of a, maybe the plague coming on and that that would protect the person from death. Why they want to protect the person from being called home to Jesus, I don't know. But, of course, the, the goddess problem, how they can explain that. However, 590 CE was not the beginning of it. Here's Pliny the Elder. Back in 77 CE, he says in the Natural History, which, by the way, the Natural History was this huge, like, 10 volumes of some couple of dozen books in these 10 volumes, that was supposed to be on everything that they knew at the time. Quite interesting, all the things that they knew or thought they knew. And he said, of course, why is it that we salute a person when he sneezes? And pointing out that some people thought it was important to mention the name of the person that they salute as well. So you can't just try this on only Christians, although Judeo-Christian thinking was that the soul was your breath. God breathed life into the uh, forms of Adam and Eve, and now they became a living being. So the breath was the life, and of course, that's what happens when a baby is born. They take a breath. That's when they become alive. The idea with the sneeze is that your breath is being forcibly taken out. And if you think about it, too, you really can't just make yourself sneeze. You might feel some, some gastrointestinal gas coming on from above, above or below, and you have some way to control that. But with the sneeze, it just kind of happens to you. It's almost like a seizure. So the ancient people thought it was a sign from the deities and that um, when you sneezed, it, it was almost an omen. And so that was why it was important to salute, as Pliny says, when he sneezed. But even that's not the oldest version of it. 
Um, Buddha sneezed when he was teaching the Dharma. I've misspelled Dharma up there. This is from 4th or 5th century BCE. So he was giving a lecture, and the monks uh, said, May the Lord live long, may the welfare live long. And made a loud noise with all the people he was lecturing, saying this. And his talk on the Dharma was interrupted. And the Buddha stopped, and he said, Now, monks, when long life is spoken to one who sneezed, can he for this reason live or die? And, of course, they all denied, well, no, of course not. Our saying is not going to affect it. So he, Buddha responded by saying, well, then you shouldn't say it. You shouldn't say that sort of thing to someone who sneezes. And whoever does say it, that's an offense. That's wrongdoing. So even to this day, I'm, I've heard that Buddhist monks do not say something if you sneeze. If you can find a Buddhist monk, find a way to sneeze and see if it's true or not. But in the 21st century, as I said, there's some SARS-2 uh, considerations. It seems to be just a reflexive social convention. People just say it. And it's interesting to consider, is it meaningless? Does it subtly endorse God is, especially if they say God bless instead of just bless you? Also, if you don't say it, that indicate that maybe you're being impolite or rude. You're not Take, paying any attention to this person sneezing. You're uh, not caring about them or at least being inattentive. And then that raises the further question, well, if somebody's kind of doing you a favor and recognizing you when you sneeze, they're saluting you as Pliny said, should you express gratitude? And our atheists, uh, you know, how should we respond when he blesses you? And we'll get to that in a minute too. Um, what, is, what other of you think about this? Just have a quick interlude. People have a Opinion as to whether it's meaningless or whether it's subtly endorsed Godism. How does that strike you when somebody says, God bless you when you sneeze? You can unmute uh, yourself and make a comment here. Oh, yeah. Well, the one, that, the one that comes to mind that I heard is, may the deity of your choice not favorably in your direction. <laughs> Now that's much you might say, but what about as an atheist? Uh, what would what would you, should you say? Should you express gratitude? Well, I don't know about gratitude. I'm just saying that responding with some humor is probably one of the best choices. I think something they yeah probably or something semi-educational. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. The other thing is that, as I said, if you don't say it, maybe you're impolite so it implies that this bless you business might be some kind of a social duty and saying it expresses some kind of solidarity with people like you're making a connection with them you're being polite you're being courteous and maybe it's a, a micro option as opposed to a micro option when you say something that maybe is a subtle dig so you have all these elements um, that come into this of this habit of saying this to people when they see. So first of all, the best way to think about this is to be proactive and get in the habit. Of course, it's pretty tough to say something to yourself when you sneeze, but I know when someone sneezes around me, I try to be the first person to say something and I say, Gesundheit. Yes. Down here in Texas, we might say, Alud, which means the same thing, good health. Or you might say, live long. Live long and prosper. Uh, supposedly, the uh, Jews, the Orthodox Jews and the Muslims, too, say, peace be upon you, or shalom achaim. Or we could say something innovative, may the force be with you, or something along the way, uh, lines that John suggested. Uh, and, of course, uh, with SARS-2 going on, we could say, cover your mouth. So here we get to what I was talking about. What should we say to the blessers? Maybe just say nothing. How many people think we should just say nothing? Is that the best way? Or should we say thanks? How about if we say, hail Satan? <laughs> How about if we say, well, no worries, I'm still alive. Because, of course, uh, there are these uh, folklorish type things that when you sneeze, your soul comes out. And uh, that's, that's a near-death experience. Um, they even found some things online where people were asking whether or not it was true that your heart stopped when you sneezed. 
So hopefully some people out there teach their kids that when you sneeze, your heart stops. And you have to say that to people to kind of get their heart stop, uh, started up again. So in, in that case, you might say, oh, oh, that helped a lot. You could be referring to the sneeze or you could be referring to what was said to you. Now, in Turkey, they say, Kok yasa. you say, and what is the, does that mean good health? What does that mean? Long live, çok yasa. There was no, there's a, uh, a dot under the C and, and under the S. So it's çok yasa. That means live long, live a lot. Oh, I'd be kind of uh, afraid to say choke to somebody who's sneezing because that <laughs> might suggest you wish that next they would choke. No, but no, I can that's see not that. It. Choke means I know that's not it, but but no. in English that might, might yeah. be implied. <laughs> yeah, but choke means a lot. Yesha means live, live long, live a lot. Oh, oh so that's saying long life. Yeah. All right. right. So what do you say when someone says bless you? Well, yeah, nothing is better, but I say definitely don't say hail Satan unless you want to reinforce their beliefs that atheists are Satan worshippers. <laughs> okay, there is one right. in a. Uh, Let's say I sneeze and somebody said "chok yasha." My response would be "sendegur," and you see it too. You see me uh, more. I'm going to put it right. there. I have read that uh, there's a whole little ritual of what what people should say back and forth. So this is not something just that uh, atheists today talk about. This is actually worked out in many different cultures as to what you should say in that situation. Um, of course. Uh, I don't think there's any rituals worked out for passing gas from some other part of your body. Well, there's one that you that might be a cultural thing to uh, immediately look at the dog and say, Fido! So at any rate, these are interesting things to think about. And uh, I don't know that very many other churches do talk about these things, but this is why we say that our church is a means for exploration of discover and discovery, of trying to make sense of the quality of our lives and the challenge of reimagining religion to make it something we can uh, talk about anything, question anything, be creative, innovative, and that serves human happiness and human purposes. We could come back to this later. We did not uh, present any dog. We should, we did not tell you what to say, how to say it, or uh, what to say back. Um, and again, there's all these little ins and outs, especially the fact that, it really probably depends who is saying God bless uh, to you. If it's someone who knows you're an atheist and trying to dig at you, that's a little different than somebody who just innocently says it without even thinking. A few things that happened on February 20th over the uh, many, many years of human existence of uh, our species being around on this planet. First of all, in 1804, first steam locomotive uh, uh, went through its trials in Wales in the United Kingdom. Uh, and in 1828, the Cherokee Phoenix begins publication. When I saw that, read about that, I thought, well, what the Cherokee Phoenix, what's that? This was the first Native American newspaper published in Native American language. Somebody had worked out, I guess the uh, Native Americans did not have much in the way of written language, but somebody had worked out uh, a version of it. So that was the Cherokee Phoenix. In 1828, 20 years later, Communist Manifesto published, Marx and Engels. In 1878, the first telephone directory came out. That was in New Haven, Connecticut. So kind of a, a day of things being published in addition to that steam locomotive that was uh, invented. A couple other things, though, on February 21st, 1918, and it's following the uh, tradition of having th the years that end in eight, this uh, bird here is Carolina parakeet. Apparently there were at least four, approximately four parrots native to North America that were uh, running around in the United States. Might still be one of those in the very extreme Southern Texas, the green parakeet. But we always think about the passage pigeon and the great auk having gone extinct. But uh, this was one that uh, was driven to extinction and the last one in the Cincinnati's on this day in 1918. Full bird, I think. Also in 1947, Edwin Land demonstrated the first Polaroid camera. 
to a conference, I believe it was, uh, it might have been in New York City, I, I don't recall exactly, it was out east some. We don't really think too much about Edwin Land, but uh, this guy was a powerhouse of invention, it's just an amazing individual who would just work day and night and uh, very much in the mold of uh, Edison and um, uh, Tesla invented all kinds of stuff, but of course he, he's known primarily for the instant camera. Anybody have a Polaroid still? I think you can still get them. Yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, Edwin H. Land also advised uh, President Eisenhower. He was uh, very good in the um, reconnaissance business with the military because of his instant photography knowledge and methods. So a lot of the pictures that were taken from U-2 uh, flights, he had a hand in. Edwin H. Land said some very interesting things, at least two but um, he, he's left a hole. He did, all of his papers and forth were destroyed because he did not want to have a cult following. I, he he did, did not want to be remembered as another Edison or another Tesla. So you can read those for yourself, but I thought it was very interesting that he said that the whole idea of an invention is that it has to come into a world that's not prepared for it. It has to be something kind of, a, whoa, where did that come from? Because if the world were prepared for it, it would not be more of an invention. And I especially like what he described at one time as his actual motto, not to do it that somebody else can do. If somebody else can do it, let them do it. What you should do is the thing that only you can do. A project that is important, nearly impossible, but that you are specially suited for. I think that's just really a, a very uh, inspiring thing. And uh, of the many of the things he said, many of them did have to do with maximum improvement of each individual person. Uh, he had a hand in uh, testified before Congress at one point was uh, his words on that occasion were not uh, shredded after his death, but he had a hand apparently in public television getting started up and pointing out what a great tool that would be to educate the public and help every individual American achieve their potential. Also on February 1st, the design of the, this peace sign was uh, completed. Um, this was actually, if you see it, that sign on the right, down in the bottom of the sign that says, note and name, it says Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, or CND. And CND, uh, cnduk.org still exists, but this was a, a campaign for nuclear disarmament. And the peace sign, when I was a kid, I was told, this is a crucifix that put upside down with the arms broken. So it's a blasphemous anti-Christian soul. But actually it was composed of the two four signals for N and D in the blue and the green respectively on the left side uh, with a circle around it. So that was the nuclear disarmament symbol and ultimately came to be used as a kind of a generic universal symbol for peace. Well, here are our principles. If we were to have a dogma, and we have talked about picking these apart, reason, and then especially the last three, which are all different, subtly different, enjoyment, appreciation, and love. And interestingly enough, it spells real. How about that? Just a few words about getting along with each other. Um, we don't want to let politics especially, but it could be other things too, destroy the civility and the care that we have for each other. The care that we have for each other is much more important than any political thing because this is what we live with every day. Uh, and interestingly enough, you do see this in the halls of government. They have all kinds of rules for civility. Um, I think I have seen the British Parliament get quite on hand, but at least uh, in America, you're supposed to be calling everybody the honorable this and the honorable that. And of course, in court law, everybody's uh, very civil and the judge could jail you for uh, contempt of court if you're not. In the past, I put up 15 principles of civility and we can go through these uh, slowly bit by bit and return to them from time to time. But number one and number two are paying attention and listening. Now they're a little different too. Paying attention is more generic and has to do with paying attention to everything about the way a person is presenting themselves, their point of view. Um, sometimes we are aware of the fact that somebody says something, they say it in a very animated, 
raising their voice, waving their arms around the way. Um, they may be red in the face and, and all sorts of things. But that's a little different than listening to their actual words and to try to pay attention to those words and try to remove distractions so that you really can pay attention and to listen to hear what they say and realize that maybe you are not hearing what they're saying and to not be afraid to uh, respond, not by with a comment initially, but just feeding back and saying something to the effect of, well, I understand you to be saying this. And that gives a chance to correct you in case you're mistaken. So we don't want to get all hung up on people have misunderstandings and so many so much of the time, that is what happens when you hear people talking with each other. And remember, too, that, and we've talked about this in the past at church services, that we put a lot of emphasis on reason and our mental and cognitive faculties and how we think things through and so forth. But we are also embodied minds. Our minds are affected by our bodies. Uh, obviously, if you're in pain or if you sneeze, it might interrupt your thought. Um, but also we know that posture affects how your mental processes work. Uh, I think maybe some of you have read about the fact that when people are being interviewed or interrogated and they're asked a question, the interrogators who know what they're doing pay attention to whether the person leans back or sits forward or looks up to the right or looks up to the left uh, or covers their mouth. There's all kinds of little things like that. If you're not familiar with that, it would be good to do so. And remember that these are not just telltale signs of other bulls' expression, but they are feedback mechanisms for yourself. So when other people are talking, we should mentally perhaps um, put hands in front of our mouths, uh, uh, determine to let them have their, their say, uh, lean forward. And of course, the other thing I forgot to mention too, when people are talking, sometimes they are kind of drawn in, sometimes take up a lot of room and, and the spreading themselves out, that's kind of an, a sign of aggression. But as I say, it works the opposite too. If we want to not be overly aggressive, we should not spread out. We should kind of track in, uh, maybe not fold your arms uh, over your chest, which uh, is a kind of a closed in, closed minded posture, um, but uh, at least not to be kind of in attack mode. You know, we know that animals that are in attack mode, you know, they put out their wings or they uh, put their arms, their, their hair stands on end, and, you know, they make themselves bigger. So think about making ourselves smaller and understand that this word, understand, actually has an interesting, I have not read up and really studied thoroughly the etymology, but we say understand, not overstand. We understand because it as as if we stand beneath the person that we are trying to understand. It's as if we're trying to make an effort to run their software in our heads so that we can really get a grasp of what it is they're saying. Of course, we can snap out of that. We're not talking about being brainwashed, but we're talking about understanding and uh, taking a uh, uh, maybe even an, I hate that word inferior because I don't mean to say you're inferior, but in other words, a, uh, a submissive role to understand where the other person is coming from so that you can respond appropriately and not to a straw man. Same thing with your voice. If your voice is small and it's calm and it's not varying itself and its tone very much you're checking things through in a calm collected way versus getting very excited and telling people this is what i think gosh darn it listen to me that is a kind of a different way to communicate you see uh and then as i say the physical responses besides that the um how much space you take up and so forth Lots of in and ins and outs of this whole business of embodied minds. And this is a relatively recent area of research and study among sociologists and psychologists. I definitely commend you. Uh, just look up embodied minds. You can Google it and see what kinds of things are out there. Remember, too, as Epictetus said, it's impossible for anyone to learn what you think you already know. So if you interact with people with the intention, as I hope you, of learning something, otherwise we, we leave the interaction no better than when we came into it. So we, that, that requires that we realize that we don't already know many things. 
And T.H. Huxley, who we've talked about, we talked about him last, last month, in fact, uh, he pointed out that if a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, who of us knows enough to be out of danger? That little knowledge is a dangerous thing uh, comes from a poem by Alexander Pope. His words actually was a little learning is a dangerous thing. And th this is just a great little short piece of this uh, essay on criticism poem of Alexander Pope's. Uh, I think definitely worth uh, committing to memory as much as uh, uh, to be or not to be. A little learning, and I'll just read it because it's nice. It's, it's nice to hear it. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not, period in spring. There shallow draughts intoxicate the brain, and drinking largely sobers us again. By the way, if you look up the period in spring, this was a uh, spring that was uh, sacred to the muses. And of course, the muses, from whom we get the word music, were the um, divinities who inspire us um, with uh, ideas and of course, uh, for music and poetry, the Pyrian Spring. Very nice little, um, piece of poetry and reminds us that we can easily become arrogant when we know something about something. And you really need to know a lot more about that something, realize how much you don't know, uh, and to become more sober instead of thinking that you know it all. There's always something more that we can learn about things. And so that's why we should try not to become involved with other people nor when we're intoxicated. Drunk people do not in interact with others very well most of the time. And then I'll just move on to begging portion, please, please. Free thought not being me. Go to our church website, churchoffreethought.org. I tried to get up. It said the server wasn't responding earlier, but uh, I hope it's responding now or can figure out what's, what's up with that. I haven't talked to our webman in quite a while. Um, but we do depend on everyone's support. This church would be nothing without supporters, uh, both those who show up here and participate and uh, do things. And I really appreciate uh, uh, John Goche for posting this later on YouTube uh, and for uh, just attending and interacting and especially financial contributions also very, very much uh, appreciated. And I know several of you here have been generous, but if you have never given us anything or not in a while, Go to our PayPal link. You can donate a dollar, just a dollar if that's all that you can manage. Anybody can do that, I think. The main reason to give us your money, because we can do together what none of us can do on our own. You, want, you don't want that filthy money in your, contaminating your person and your bank account anyway. Help us promote your values. Things like we've talked about today and that we're about to embark on during discussion. I hope to hear more if you uh, too shy to comment during the presentation here. And always remember that we should demonstrate our commitment by being the future that we wish to see. We do want to see a better world, but you, it's, it's not enough to just dream about it, wish for it. We have to think about how to get there and take positive steps ourselves, not to just be keyboard warriors, but take actual uh, concrete steps ourselves to help make the world a better place so that when we come to the end of our lives we can look back and say yeah we we tried to do our part and with that we'll move on to question and answer discussion uh, we'll see uh, how long we can go on this uh, no set time but uh, I think it's I don't see the I don't have a clock here right in front of me but we must be getting on about an hour since we signed on and if you are on you again remember to Ring the bell, make a comment, join in, and uh, help us move this church forward. Thank you very much, everyone, and good morning.